you're quiet till noon. No one talks, which I loved. You wake up really early, like 4.35, go to the Zendo, which is the chapel, basically, of the mm -hmm. monastery. It's like this beautiful room. Everyone's quiet. You meditate for like two straight hours in the morning. Just sit wow. there. You don't move. No one moves. Do you get to eat? <laughs> what about coffee? Do they have coffee? Okay, I always got coffee first because I. you're not allowed to yawn. You're not allowed to fall asleep. You, you kind of can't really stop yawning. Like, yawning happens. <laughs> the older monks, like, I would see it almost happen to them sometimes, but then they, like, swallow it. They'd be like... <sharp inhale> It's just an old tradition, but I guess it's like rude to yawn. And I'm like, okay. I get that. that and also sense. it's contagious. Right? But I'm like, it is 4 a.m. So yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I would have some like tea before so I could wake up a little bit. Because it sucks when you want to meditate for a long period of time. And then the whole time you're just like thinking about other stuff. Like it's nice to have a little caffeine so you can yeah. at least give it your best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then we would do chores. The chores could be anything from like cleaning to working in the garden, eat lunch, and we could talk. And then we would do more chores. And then we would go to like elect or something and then meditate more in the evening go to sleep at like 10 so not a lot of sleep you got to get a nap in there and then there's like a silent retreat once a month at this place so there's like a week of every month where you're like totally quiet mm -hmm. and it's not just that you're quiet they like put paper over all the mirrors all the clocks you couldn't make eye contact with anyone totally in your own zone all the way in your own head the eye contact thing is a little bit weird to it's me. strange the clocks right and the mirrors i get uh-huh Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. My guest today is a redheaded, tatted yogi who was on a path to self-discovery before she ever landed in the adult industry. She is one half of the Online Forever podcast, and I am so excited to talk to the beautiful Sydney Summers today. Yay, I'm so excited to talk to you. <laughs> so um, I do want to get you know get into the origin story, but um, the Online Forever title mm -hmm. is really interesting uh-huh can you tell me kind of like what that means I, does it mean i guess what i think it means it means what you think it means although it has morphed in the you know we've done the podcast for like a year and it's mm -hmm. already changed a lot semantically to us i think but yeah Susie, my co-host came up with that like long ago she had sort of a vision for mm -hmm. this podcast mostly because of the first question you get asked a lot when you're in the adult industry is like, how are you sure you want to be online forever? Like that's yeah, what's going to happen to you. And it is what happens to you. So absolutely, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, exploring what that means to different people and how they feel about it. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, since we're on this train, we may as well start with talking about your podcast. So um, what made you decide to start one? You know, being honest, I guess the honest answer is I wanted another route of uh, content to maybe go viral with, but mm -hmm. I also am just so grateful now to have the outlet to express myself and have something going on outside of the adult industry, which is, I think, so important mm -hmm. to me anyway. Yeah. I'm very grateful for it. And yeah, I'm really excited to see where it goes. It's still pretty new, but yeah. Yeah. Susie, like, I think I tweeted something about like, oh, I want to start a podcast. And Susie was like, saw it and messaged me immediately. She was like, I've wanted to do this for a long time. Like, let's go. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, Susie. Susie Stoller. OK. All yeah, right. She's my, my co-host. OK. Because mm -hmm. I want to make sure we get the, the full name out there. There's yes. a couple Susies out there. So I want to yes. make sure I was thinking of the right <laughs> same person. So how has your experience with the podcast been so far? <laughs> it's been up and down. We had a really um, weird last year. Had a lot of um, had a lot of pit stops along the way, I guess. But this season, we're about to start releasing our third season, and it feels like we are finally starting to get our feet under us and have a bit of the process smoothed out. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's it's a lot more work than people realize. Like mm -hmm. one of the you know kind of incelly weird lame comments we get a lot is like, oh, like we should start a podcast, like. Like as though anyone can just do it, which we're like, yes, anyone can start a podcast and anyone should, but it's not that easy. Like mm -hmm. it's way harder than anyone thinks it is. Yeah. Especially at first. Yeah. Because you have to find your rhythm. You have to figure out like yeah. what you are. I mean, it's kind of like yeah. finding your niche in sex work too, right? Mm -hmm. Like you can't just. No. Immediately. Yeah. Like you got to kind of feel out what makes sense for you, what mm -hmm. your fans respond to. 
But I think like podcasts are a great avenue for people. It's good for branding, whether or not, mm -hmm. you know, it ends up being like monetarily successful. And it's a good opportunity to, you know, get another side of you out there, right? Mm -hmm. Because performing is, is great, but it's just that, right? It's right. Performing, you don't really get to say what you think. Yes. And it doesn't really give a clue to your personality and, you know, who you are as a person. Yeah. We talk a lot about how podcasts are strangely more intimate than having sex on camera. Yeah. There's something way more intimate and intimidating about it in a way. Yeah. <laughs> so tell me, like, what the structure of your podcast is. Is it just the two of you talking? Do you have specific topics? Do you have guests? We have guests. I think we really, well, I think we shine in our interviews, but we get asked, we've been asked to do a lot more, like, one-on-one -on -one episodes of us just, you know, talking about girly things mm -hmm. and being girls and being silly mm -hmm. um we are we are we're haters a little bit we like to we like to um throw some shade a little bit okay. of shade here and there is always nice <laughs> calling people out and whatnot and yeah we mostly ask we've had a lot more comedians on this year we're kind of getting into i think we both kind of want some like paranormal people on the podcast we're both really into the paranormal so yeah it's it's branching out in strange new ways but it is the the unifying principle is kind of the permanency of the internet and like how that impacts people's lives and how people made it on the internet and yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now this may be um, a little bit too early of a question <laughs> um, since I'm, I'm going on on Friday, but who have your, some of your favorite guests been so far? Loved Drudd. He <laughs> was amazing. Yes, Mar and Holly Marsha got my joke. Holly's coming on on Friday. I'm so excited. So after I come on, I will be in this Obviously. list is what I'm saying. Obviously, the top slot will be filled. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying. I'm going to try not to interview you during this interview, which is one of my habits as a podcast guest, I feel like. <laughs> yeah, I do the same thing. Right? But I also love talking about myself. So Perfect. you're you're free save to Save it up. So. Save it up. <laughs> okay, so Dread. Loved Dread. He was, so I will say I've had Dread on as well. And men typically do not perform well on my podcast, no. like at all, because my no. audience is 96% men and they want to hear from the women. Like mm. they almost like guys just tend to tank. I still have them on because I think it's important to have a different perspective, but numbers mm -hmm. wise, like people are generally not interested in them. That's so interesting. Dread was one of my most popular interviews. Oh, people want to know. People are obsessed with him. Yeah. He like completely, he's a total exception to the rule. Yes. Like people love like, dread. I mean, he he has the the whole package in every every sense of the word. And sure. he's so lovely and humble and and nice and well spoken yes. and like great storyteller. Yeah, like he's great. Yeah, he's really, really like great. funky guy. Yeah. So yes, yeah, so we we love dread. Um, we love the comedians we've had on. We we just had on Che Arena. I don't know if you know him. Mm -mm. He was a great interview. That's coming out. Um, probably our first interview of this new season, and. Who else? I'm trying to think of other performers. Kira Noir was oh, amazing. She's amazing. She's coming back to the podcast actually. Oh, end love. Of this month. I will be watching. Her I've had her. I had her on, but that was a long time ago. So mm -hmm. she probably has lots more to say. Yes, <laughs> it's been it's been many years since she's been on. So and we had we had Lena Paul on, and she's also just like oh the she's best. great. She's so smart and oh, like I know. so well educated and has really interesting yes um viewpoints yeah i i've had her on twice as yes. well and both of them were killer episodes. yes and she she announced her pregnancy on our episode which was so fun. i didn't know she was yes. pregnant she had the baby oh my god the gosh. baby is here he's amazing oh my god yeah. i have to text her that's so, so great she, she's gonna be a good mom i know she's she's like this shit is easy she's like everyone tells me it's hard now she's like i got it in the bag i'm like i love that for you <laughs> having a baby yeah wait till it's a toddler you just my daughter's three the storm is coming lena <laughs> <laughs> so those are like some really impressive guests yeah we've, we've had some good folks and yeah can't wait to have more really exciting <laughs> what has been um one of the like best things about your podcast like for you like personally um i think that podcasting is one of several like routes of performance in my life that have really helped me process the like um oh, this is such an intense way to put it but like the self-hatred of performance like I don't know if you experienced that but it like I've always had that especially it was worse when I was younger um when I would do I did like a lot of improv when I was a kid and after the show like we the whole troupe would just like 
we really felt bad about ourselves if like the show was bad or something like mm-hmm. that instead of just like leaving it in the past and moving mm-hmm. on and the podcast like listening to yourself back over and over again and like growing as a person while you're setting yourself in stone in this recording that people can listen to for Mm -hmm. years like I think it can be hard but it's a great lesson in accepting your past self and Mm -hmm. being forgiving towards her and loving her too even though Mm -hmm. maybe you're different from her (laughs) yeah I definitely um read comments left on you know episodes I did six years ago and I'm just like and I'm like still offended, even though like that doesn't apply right? anymore because I know I've grown and improved as an interviewer since then. Mm-hmm. But I'm I'm still like still get mad. And that negative negativity bias of reading the the shitty comments and then yeah. those ones standing out is so annoying. Yeah, it's so annoying. It's so yeah. good to process that stuff, but it's yeah. hard. It's a lot of work. You can also just get to a point in your life where I am generally where I just don't read motherfucking Amen. comments. So you Amen. can say whatever you want. Mani, I don't mani, see mani. it. I don't <laughs> care. It's not actually true. I read some of them, but a lot of them I don't read. So there you go. So, um, all right. So let's rewind okay. and let's go back to the beginning. So normally I start with, you know, questions of how my guests got into the adult industry, but you did some things before getting into the industry that I want to get into first because they're so interesting. Um, so random. Starting with your time <laughs> in wilderness camps. Yes. How did you get into that and what was that like? So I started as a field guide for wilderness therapy programs when I was 24. It was kind of my get out of my home state card. Mm -hmm. I knew a few people who had done it and I knew that it was a way to go live outside basically full time, which was very appealing to me. And, you know, I, they say in those programs, a lot of the people that are called to teach at them have a lot of work they need to do on themselves and are attracted to these therapy programs because they're benefiting from them too, which is so true. And yeah, I worked at a, I worked at a program that I thought was very lovely and was very beneficial for the kids there but obviously the industry has caught a lot of flack especially recently i think um paris hilton's documentary was a big um uh, really amplified like the voices of people who have been really harmed by some of the camps because it's Mm -hmm. a really deregulated industry Mm -hmm. which is a big issue obviously Mm -hmm. you're holding minors at like camps Mm -hmm. like gotta (laughs) i don't know It it should be more regulated but I loved the program I worked for. Um, it's it's a program where they really emphasized natural consequences as opposed to programs that are what's called behavioral modification. Mm-hmm. So at those programs, they do like rewards and punishments for different behaviors that the kids do. But at our program, they were really strong about um, basically letting the kids behave how they want mm-hmm. and then letting the natural consequences of the group and of being outside all the time like kind of handle the rewards and punishments instead of like taking that on yourself and that was very interesting for me because I wasn't really raised like that you know Mm -hmm. so it was really cool to see how that sense of responsibility was really just instilled in these kids and it made them really want to be good people intrinsically instead of like forcing them to act Mm -hmm. a certain way so like how do you mean so like say that so the program kind of works like most days you're hiking to like a new spot it's a nomadic program there's not like a home base so say you leave camp really late one day because a kid is like has like doesn't want to hike they're like throwing a tantrum and they're like i'm not hiking today so then the whole camp gets to the whole group gets to camp like hours late maybe in the middle of the night when you're not supposed to get there maybe you can't find your food because of that and then everyone's like kind of mad at this kid because they're like you could have just cooperated but instead you're just gonna fucking leave them there I mean, that's a natural consequence. (laughs) Bye. (laughs) What happened to uh, Amanda? She got eaten by a mountain lion. (laughs) Natural consequence. (laughs) I left her behind. She had it coming. She had it coming. eh? You know, (laughs) nature. What can you do? (laughs) But yeah, and you know, nature. They say that nature is like ninety percent of the program. So that takes a lot of the responsibility off the staff to like be this perfect person. It's like you just need to like show up, be the best that you can be, and like being outside and being in this peaceful place and being kind of forced to reflect on yourself when you don't have all these like distractions of Mm -hmm. everyday life. Like it's just, it was so good for the kids. Like it was such a rewarding job, like really the most rewarding job I think I've ever had where you just see people change so quickly. Yeah. And like really become a part of a community. Yeah. That's really great. Yeah. 
Do you have any like crazy stories from that camp? Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Um, yeah, so, oh God. Definitely, like, I had, like, one student that stands out as, like, for sure the wildest. It was, like, one of my very last shifts. And she, like, came in guns blazing. It was a kid who had been to, like, more than 10 programs before this, like, really struggled and had not found one that had been helpful. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of at the point where you're like, why do her parents keep sending her to camps at this point? Mm -hmm. Like, but she seemed to change a lot during our program. That being said, this story kind of negates that a little bit, but <laughs> when she showed up, she definitely like weaponized her bloody tampon, which was new one for me. She like took it out, threw it at staff. Like that was wild. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> and she like calmed down a lot during the course of her stay, but this is so, this is so insane. Okay. so. We get like fresh food uh, once or twice a week. I can't remember how often. Oh, fuck, dude, I know and where this is going. You know where it's going. But did you know that it's a jalapeno? It's not a cucumber. It's not a carrot. It's a jalapeno. So yeah, basically this kid used this jalapeno to masturbate, and the staff found out about it, and they were like, "Wait, no, that that's not oh, where I thought it was going. Where I thought was it was wrong. going. <laughs> I thought that's where it went. Okay, okay, sorry. <laughs> Tell your. Let me not try to predict what you're going to say. <laughs> Tell your story because that is not. <laughs> so that I, happened once. And then we were like, don't do that. And then okay, we... so hold on. Okay. Hold on. Okay, because <laughs> I was picturing like she was putting tampons in the food. <laughs> That's where I thought you were going. But clearly, no, you were not going there at all. So fresh food, she decides to masturbate with a jalapeno. Yeah, and we were like, don't. Did and she like put it, like how did you know? I, kn I know because she told one of the other students and the students told us because they were like, this sounds dangerous. And we were like, that is probably dangerous. Did she put it like back in the food? So they, you all get like your own fresh produce and you like keep it in your backpack, right? And you can like eat it throughout the week if you save it or you can eat it all at once. You know, it's kind of your and decision. And then starve consequences. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, she used it to masturbate again after that. Like it was like she was about to leave the program and I think she was like, maybe acting out a little bit like was nervous but she it, it broke inside of her this was on my shift we were supposed to do this really cool hike that day where we were going to these like ruins and instead we had to like wait for a douche to be delivered to our group in the middle of the desert because she was like freaking out like there were seeds inside of her it was it was, it was insane <laughs> truly insane god we talk about like spicy content <laughs> You know, like when we want to say that like something's on your OnlyFans, but you can't say OnlyFans because you're on fucking Instagram. You're like, check out my spicy page with a jalapeno. Like that girl literally was very literal about that. Oh my God. I also, I had this awesome shift. It was like, all it was in the adult group, which they're still really young. They're just over 18, but it was all girls. And like, I think like a couple days in, we all realized that everyone in the group was like, either gay or bisexual. And I didn't know this till after my shift, but all of the girls were like hooking up at night. I was like, guys, you weren't supposed to be doing that. That's bad. <laughs> but also I would have done the same thing at your age. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. Man, what a year. <laughs> that, that jalapeno story was, I did not, that was not what I thought. No one saw that one coming. Wow. <laughs> So um, after that, you ended up spending some time at a monastery. Is that right? Yes, actually, like right after that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so like, tell me how that came to be. So, yeah, I was de definitely on my you know my own journey during that time, and I was reading a lot of like self help books and a lot about Buddhism and stuff. And I read this book written by a monk who had a monastery in Spokane, Washington. And I was like, oh, I didn't know there were like monasteries in the mm -hmm. States. I thought they were all like, you know, in Asia or something. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I guess you can just go live in a monastery. And then that idea like really embedded itself in my head. Um, so I went after Utah, I went up to Washington, like right off the coast and worked at this um, resort there for a while, uh, teaching yoga. It was so fun. And then I got enough money to go stay at this monastery in Oregon for a while. And it was awesome. I've been back a few times since. And I, you know, I, I, I brought that up in, when you were like, is there anything you want to talk about? Because I, I've been like processing a lot of, I think, the behaviors and, you know, like coping mechanisms I picked up during the pandemic. And I realized I was like, I think I would literally be a monk right now if it weren't for the pandemic happening, which is so funny to me because now I do porn. 
<laughs> just like the opposite. It's kind of the opposite. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so tell me, like, tell me a little bit about this monastery. Tell us about like what your day to day routine was like. Okay. So you're quiet till noon. No one talks, which I loved so much. Uh, you wake up really early, like 4 35. Mm-hmm. Go to the Zendo, which is the like chapel basically of the mm-hmm. monastery. It's like this beautiful room. Everyone's quiet. You meditate for like two straight hours in the morning. Just wow. sit there. You don't move. No one moves. Do you get to eat? <laughs> what? Do you get to eat first? What about coffee? Do they have coffee? Okay, I always got coffee first because I you're not allowed to yawn. You're not allowed to fall asleep, and you know it kind of allowed to yawn. You kind of can't really stop yawning like yawning happens the older monks like i i would see it almost happen to them sometimes but then they like swallow it they'd be like <sighs> and i was like okay i guess like, it's like it's just an old tradition but i guess it's like rude to yawn and i'm like okay i get that, that and also sense. it's contagious right but i'm like it is 4 a.m so yeah <laughs> okay but yeah i would have some like tea before so i could wake up a little bit because it sucks when you like want to meditate for a, a long period of time and then the whole time you're just like thinking about other stuff like it's nice to have a little caffeine so you can yeah. at least give it your best yeah, yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> but yeah then we would do chores and the chores could be anything from like just cleaning to working in the garden and then we would eat lunch and we could talk and then we would do more chores and then we would go to like a lecture or something and then meditate more in the evening go to sleep at like 10 so not a lot of sleep you got to get a nap in there during the day i did um and then there's like a silent retreat once a month at this place so there's like a week of every month where you're like totally quiet Mm -hmm. and it's not just that you're quiet i didn't know this but they like put paper over all the mirrors all the clocks you couldn't make eye contact with anyone so you're like totally in your own zone like all the way in your own head Hmm. Uh uh-huh the eye contact thing is a little bit weird to it's me. It's strange, the clocks right? And the mirrors, I get. Uh huh. The eye contact, I guess, is like you're just like I know that it's like silence is like speaking, but you still, I feel like, communicate with other people with your eyes. You know? Yeah. So maybe that's part of. I'm not sure, but yeah, yeah. So what? I mean, obviously, you really enjoyed it. Yeah. What about that appealed to you? <sighs> you know, I, I. I'm so drawn towards like simplicity and I feel like this part of me I've like finally come to terms with but I've always just like wanted to be a person that existed like a hundred thousand years ago like a monkey like not in this modern day society and I've like I feel like I've finally yeah come to terms with the fact that I live in 2024 and there's nothing I can really do about that but who knows maybe it's like a past life maybe it's just some weird personality trait of mine but I don't know I and I've always been drawn to like a non non traditional lifestyles. So yeah, I just I loved being there. It was like one of my first experiences where I didn't feel like I had to be like the funniest person or the smartest person in the room. Like everyone's just there to like better themselves and be spiritual and mm-hmm. relax and yeah, learn stuff. So it was just a beautiful environment. It was a great community. Like it's really hard to find community, I think, in this day and age. And it was like everyone there's there for the same purpose. You're like all on the same schedule and yeah. Yeah. It's really beautiful. <laughs> Interesting. So what are your views on like religion and spirituality and God? I mean, do you believe in a God? I, I definitely believe in a higher power. I think that religion is kind of like a weirdly bastardized like human way of trying to understand something that is extremely mysterious by nature. Mm-hmm. And I think anyone who claims to know what that great mystery is or what its name is I'm just like skeptical of a bit Mm -hmm. so maybe the institution of religion I find kind of suspicious Mm -hmm. but I I am really spiritual and I I think that all religions have a kernel of like really beautiful spirituality to them it's just they yeah it can get a little weird when humans try to like act like they know what's going on Mm -hmm. you know and use them to control other people exactly and like benefit themselves yeah which we see a lot of yes so how do you incorporate spirituality into your day-to-day life? Um, I, I really try to mimic a lot of like the monastery in my day-to-day life. Like I'm really, I, I live alone and I love my solitude and I love journaling and I still meditate a lot. And just, I, I really want to have like a very clear mind that is um, able to like receive 
big ideas and big messages, you know, and it's it's really hard to do that when you work in social media primarily because I feel like social media really, um, cl- yeah, it's just very cluttering. Yeah, internally. it's a lot of noise. Yes, exactly. So constantly trying to s- seek that balance because I definitely, I mean, I love dopamine as much as the next person. I love a good scroll and I find it so addictive and um, I really try to like minimize that in my life, sometimes successfully, sometimes less so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely an interesting new challenge that we face. Yeah. You know, because before, you know, the worst thing that you could do was like watch a lot of TV, but even then you'd have to be home to do that. You'd mm-hmm. have to be present in the world when you were out in your car or out at the streets or at the grocery store. And now it's like you can be it, disconnected everywhere. from the world at all times. So true. Especially if you get the new fucking Apple. The Apple The 15. Apple Vision Glass. No, the oh, Apple the, Vision Glass. Oh my God, yes. With the battery pack, which yes. by the way, I tried out a couple of days. They ha- had it at our office. And uh, you can literally walk around with that thing because, you know, it's AR, you can see, and you can like not, you can like not what? be in this world at all. Like you can walk around, you wow. can see things, right? So you won't run into shit, but you can also have like your desktop up here and like a movie playing here. Like you can be fully disconnected from reality. If you Perma man cave. That's insane. Yeah, I had this therapist say something really interesting to me once because we were talking about how phones are like portals essentially. And she said something like, oh yeah, the magician never wants to get lost in his own portal. And I was like, oh, that's such an interesting way to think about phones. Yeah. You know? And and working in social media. Yeah. And yeah. carrying it around all the time. And Yeah. yeah. Yeah, don't get high on your own supply. Uh huh. (laughs) (laughs) All right, guys, we're gonna take a quick commercial break, and then when we come back, we're gonna talk about porn. I swear, we're (laughs) we're gonna get there. (laughs) See you in a minute. Hey, everyone. Today, I want to share something special for the penis owners in our lives, and it's all about overcoming a challenge that's more common than you might think: erectile dysfunction or ED. You know, in my line of work, I've seen ED happen firsthand. And I know how it can affect not only performance, but overall confidence. It's a sensitive topic, but so important to talk about because it affects so many people. And this is where Blue Chew comes in, a game changer that I have seen work wonders. Blue Chew offers chewable tablets that can help those with ED get stronger and longer lasting erections, making those intimate moments even more enjoyable. And the best part, it's all done online. There's no awkward doctor visits, no waiting in the line at the pharmacy, just a simple process that respects your privacy and convenience. And I love how Blue Chew is about more than just a tablet. It's about regaining that spark and confidence. It's made with the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis, but in a chewable form, which means it can start working faster. So whether it's a special occasion or just a regular day when you wanna feel extra connected to your partner, Blue Chew gives you that support. So if ED has been a hurdle on your journey to fulfilling experiences, I encourage you to check out Blue Chew. It's an opportunity to take control and reignite those flames of passion and intimacy. And we've got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew for free when you use our promo code HOLLY at checkout. Just pay $5 in shipping. That's bluechew.com promo code HOLLY to receive your first month for free. Visit BlueChew.com for more details and important safety information. And thank you, BlueChew, for sponsoring this podcast. All right, everybody, we are back. Okay, so Sydney, um, we, you know, just talked extensively about your time at the monastery. Um, How did all of this self-exploration, spirituality lead you into getting into porn? So... After the monastery, I it was my first time my, my bank account was in the negatives. And I was like, OK, I'm just going to take a little trip back home and make some money. And then my plan was to go travel again and go become a monk, basically. So I went back home and my friend, I, I kept trying to find a job. And I only I had this job at a bakery. It was like so bad. I wasn't making any money. And I was living with my mom. And I was just like, why did I come back home? And then my friend showed me how much she was making at the strip club. And I was like, holy shit, I should do this for a little bit and make some money and then go off and do whatever I want. And yeah, I was pretty I was pretty good at stripping. I like became the top earner at this club, which was awesome. So I you mentioned before that you were teaching yoga. So uh-huh. obviously you had like 
you know, body awareness. And yes. you're like, you're like a contortionist, right? Yes. So a baby and, contortionist. Yes. So you were a baby contortionist. <laughs> yes. It's, it's, a, it's a new adventure in my life. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but was that, did you have that before you went into the strip club or? Yes. I, I did have like a really good yoga foundation and obviously being flexible is very sexual to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So that was really helpful. And I've been on stage for forever. So I was pretty comfortable like dancing and stuff like that. Um, the, the whole sales mentality was new to me, but, um, I read some like how to be a stripper, like articles and I was like, okay, I think I can, I think I could get this and yeah. Uh, and then the pandemic happened. So I was the, all the clubs shut down mm -hmm. and then I had just made my only fans. So that was sort of the segue. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, tell us about your journey into actually like doing scenes with people. So I, um, do you know Emma Magnolia? Of course, we've had yes. her on the show. Yes. So we kind of were like intense coming up together buddies in porn back in Arkansas, where we're from. Um, so we were like always living right next to each other and we just got into it together, which was so nice to like have a close friend, mm -hmm. you know, instead of having to figure it all out by yourself. But yeah, she was the stripper who showed me the. Oh, yeah. okay. Yes. So, oh, Emma. Yes. So, who was stripping so that she could support her nonprofit, which I also worked for. Narcan. Yes. Right? Yeah. So, so I was like delivering the needles with her and stripping and yeah. See so, everybody, it is a true story. It's it's a true story. I've had people have been like, "This is not true. People aren't that wonderful." Look, that would be such a weird story to make up. <laughs> uh, it would be, but it wouldn't be probably the first. The first. Yeah. But yeah yes well i'm here to uh verify <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so yeah we started doing OnlyFans together and just figuring out all the marketing and i had not been on social media for like years before that so that was weird to like get back on and suddenly mm -hmm. become like kind of dependent on it and mm -hmm. yeah and so your first scene was with her i assume my first scene was with her yeah oh. it was like a i was a i was a student in her class and I was always kind of baby and Emma was more kind of like mommy dommy situation. Uh -huh. That was sort of our dynamic back then. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I was like passing notes in this class and she had to punish me. Yeah, that was mm. my first ever technical scene. <laughs> and I assume like you knew you liked girls before that happened. Yeah, for sure. Always liked girls. So you always knew. It yeah. Wasn't like a discovery moment. Yeah. Do you consider yourself bi or do you like, yeah. like like, do you or do you have a preference on whether or not you date men or women or are you kind of pansexual? Yeah, kind kind of pansexual is accurate. Like, I definitely have the whole bi girl, like bipolar thing where it's like reactionary sexuality almost mm -hmm. like, oh, this man broke my heart. I hate men now. Now I have to like date women and then mm -hmm. women, bro women broke break my heart and then blah, blah, blah. But I don't know. I'm kind of I'm kind of on men right now. Like they're being bastards as always. So I'm also like. I'm like, oh, I want to date a girl again, too. But I also kind of like want to be a housewife with a husband and baby. So I don't know what the fuck is going mm. on, basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the, that's the <laughs> wonderful journey we call life. <laughs> so you've had some porn injuries. I, is that I, right? Yeah. Can you just tell us about <laughs> what happened. We oh, love God. we love a good scary story. It, here. It, it was it was pretty scary. Um, yeah. So my my second scene I did with Brazzers was like a threesome that filmed so late into the night everyone was just getting uncoordinated and tired and mooky you know and yeah the the guy in the scene van wild he was um he was like holding okay it was him and demi sutra mm. he was holding her hands while he was like fucking her doggy style mm -hmm. while she was eating me out mm -hmm. okay so you're visualizing this and he kind of like i guess just pumped a little too hard reared back a little too much and demi came up like at least a foot and then like fully dropped down teeth first like into my pussy <laughs> it was so scary and i did like it was like a guy getting kicked in the balls i was like oh and just like rolled over like while we were filming i was like no 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 this is not happening there was blood there was blood and and literal hair in demi's teeth like it was so fucked up the director was like god damn it because it was like almost midnight at this point like yeah. we were just trying to get it over with yeah yeah i've been there <laughs> i've been there but yeah it was really crazy because like after we stopped the bleeding it, there was a little cut it was kind of in my pubes so we were like okay we can keep going but the next day was like basically healed it was like mm. the pussy juice just magical <laughs> potion <laughs> 
that is a unique injury. I have not experienced anything specifically oh, like God. that. I would not wish it on anyone. <laughs> I've had like, you know, the ones where like you bend the dick the wrong way oh. or break the bed or accidentally oh. go in the wrong hole. <laughs> Those are fun. <laughs> but yeah, that's a very, it's a very unique porn injury. Bent dicks are just, yeah, man. I, w- I hope that never happens anywhere near me. Yeah. I yeah, don't like the sound of that. No, no. I, I can't imagine what that would be uh-uh. like. <laughs> and it can be permanent, you know? It, costs, it can cause yeah. permanent yeah, I know, no, no, no. I know guys that have, like, broken their dick. For real, for real. Yeah, for Ugh. real. Um, You have mentioned before that you were addicted to anal cleano. <laughs> I have mentioned this. Can you, can you explain this to us? <laughs> I'm kind of off the sauce at the moment. Oh, I haven't even mentioned this, but I did move this weekend, actually. I actually showed up for this podcast like two hours early. I've like been in the valley for a minute because my brain is just like super scattered right now. But anyway, I say this because I don't have my anal douche at my new house yet. So I'm not anal douching at the moment. Okay. But if if I'm with a guy who likes anal, I just... I love for it to be clean. What can I say? And I want it to happen all the time. I don't know why I do this weird thing where I like douche, but I don't tell them. And I just hope when we hang out that we have anal, but I'm not like, (laughs) you know what I mean? I'm not like douching and then being like, my ass is clean. Let's do it. I'm just like, what if my ass was mysteriously clean and we just happened to have anal? What if I was just ready for anal all (laughs) All the time? (laughs) I remember like, okay, this is kind of a random aside, but you know, like Kirsten Price and Kieran Lee, they've been married forever, right? I remember when they like first started dating, I she filled in for me last minute for somebody and I, I forget how it came up but it was something like she was already shaved and ready to go and I was like damn are you like <laughs> how you're always like this and she was like yeah I like always basically she's like I always like to be like ready for Kieran and I was like wow who does that wow I'm like dream woman <laughs> robot woman yeah I know I was like <laughs> damn Kieran you got very lucky you have a lovely wife. <laughs> Only she can put up with your bullshit. <laughs> we love you. You know we do. <laughs> I think it, it does speak to kind of the... It, it is lovely to have a hygiene routine with porn. Like, that's mm-hmm. one of the greatest parts of the industry, of being in the sex industry in general to me. I was not the most hygienic girl before I became a stripper. And then I was forced to be, and I was like, I get it now. I kind of like this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you learn so much about your own body. Yes, for real. Which is, you know, really... I mean, it's a very educational journey. Indeed. And you learn that, it, like, what works for you may not work for somebody else. You mm-hmm. know, it's like there's no, like, one blanket statement where it's like, okay, this is, like, that's why I'm always kind of cautionary about doing a kind of PSA when I'm like, girls, this is how you should clean out your vagina or your mm-hmm. butt because it's different for every girl. And what yes. works for one girl can give another girl a yeast infection. Yes. And it's like, you just got to, like, try the different things and see what makes sense for you. Yeah. Anal prep is so individualized, but I love hearing about people's routines. I'm like, what do you do? How do you do it? I will say, like, I get colonics from time to time. Oh, not so okay. often anymore, but they are. Awesome. It's the most uncomfortable 45 minutes of your life. What's uncomfortable about it? What the the physical it? sensation? Yes. Uh-huh. That they're, like, pumping all this water up your colon. It's awful. I hate it. Oh, God. I want it. I want you it. like I've it? Never, I've never had one. Oh, you haven't? But I want to. I have my shower enema. Okay. But I want to try a colonic. Yes. No, you got to do the colonic. Yeah. Because they, like, I mean. All the way up in yeah, there. Yeah, it's terrible. Oh, it's awful. They basically like have you you and you kind of like let them know like you go for as long as you can. Then you let them know when they you need. You're to tapping release. out. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Basically you tap out. <laughs> yeah. It's like it's horrible. But they like get shit, small. Literally. Intense. That's like up there. You're yeah. Like, what the fuck? It's not, and they can like look at it and tell you like if you're what you're eating, like if you drink enough, like if you drink too much alcohol like it's bizarre like they just it's like it's like tea leaves they like read your shit like coming oh my god i love that like somehow like know everything about you it's really bizarre (laughs) wow i feel like i would be great at that job honestly i feel like i would enjoy that yeah 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 and you have to like it's one of those things where it's so uncomfortable for the person at the time so you have to like make good good at small talk Mm. and then you like massage their stomach and then you also like take a magic wand to like their legs because it's really? something that you, yeah it's like you want to like massage the legs because that helps relaxes like, or something yeah i don't know it helps it like go through i don't know they oh just my have the fucking magic wand your legs i don't know it's quite bizarre oh i love that but it's great <laughs> it's great um so with your zen yoga wilderness background and and all of this <laughs> do you feel like you've carved out a niche of fans that are specifically into like those facets of your personality like mm-hmm. what is your like online porn persona i guess Oh, that's a really good question. Like, I I feel like 
there is like a niche of women in the industry who we just uh, interviewed Indica Flower, you know mm -hmm. her? Mm -hmm. Like she reminds me of that, of like people who just kind of have that healing energy, have like, and they say like people who have had like intense experiences in childhood, even though it's painful, they become like the best healers. And I do think that men are really drawn to that. Men in particular, like love that sort of maternal, caring, like I understand you, empathy sort of a, <laughs> bless you. Sorry. <laughs> You were it's trying so, so hard. hard. <laughs> Sorry, it's allergies, people. It's big allergy time here. <sighs> okay, go but on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I I definitely think that is uh, an an appeal to my fans, and I I think that I fuck in a very like almost maternal way. You mm, know, I like a very caretaker. Way. Yeah. Um, so I I'm sure that that is is somewhat of the appeal, but also it's just like I love. Um, this weird connection between flexibility and, and sexuality. Like it shouldn't necessarily be inherently sexual. It's kind of like wrong that it's sexual almost mm -hmm. because before I started doing sex work, I was like, I will never sexualize or when I started, sorry, when I first started doing sex work, I was like, I'll never sexualize yoga. And here I am today, like very much sexualizing yoga. Of course. Right. You but can't like have those moves and not be able to like, <laughs> come on exploit them a little bit yeah but yeah you know i of course there's like boundaries that exist i suppose somewhere in there and my spiritual life is not completely overlaid with my sexuality and my life online but yeah there's definitely a lot of overlap so yeah mm -hmm. um what has surprised you the most about the adult industry hmm. what has surprised me the most I think I've, hmm, I'm kind of at a weird point with porn, I think. It's been like four years now since I started. And I feel like I am, I, I think I've been surprised by how much easier it is for me to be like slutty and really enjoy filming when I have like a stable partnership in my life, which is kind mm -hmm. of ironic, I guess. But I find, I'm, I'm just such a romantic and I find it, <laughs> easier I think to um, experience that sort of vulnerability with people when I know that I have someone who like you know supports me and loves me and cares for me back at home kind of so it's a little harder for me to do porn when I'm single which I have found surprising for yeah. sure do you think that there's like some kind of deep intrinsic fear that if you meet somebody, because it's hard to meet somebody who accepts mm -hmm. someone who does sex work, right? Mm -hmm. So do you think that there's some fear in there that, you know, by doing this, like if I meet somebody that and I and they find out what I do or, you know, they see what I do that they'll they won't love me? Yeah, there, there. That's definitely a part of it. That's an element of it, which I. I, I would never be with someone who couldn't accept what I do for work right. ever. But at the same time, like it, it definitely limits your dating pool in a lot of ways, which I don't think is a bad thing. Like, I think it's good to be with someone who is comfortable enough with sex work and not part of you to be able to accept it. But it's still it's still scary and and can cause a lot of fear. Yeah. Dating and and knowing that that can really put a lot of people off and it's scary to be vulnerable about that with new yeah, people. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I <clears throat> some of you, most of you know, I have an OnlyFans, and even though I'm very tame on it, and all I do is like softcore nudes, um, I don't think that I would do that if I wasn't currently like with my husband. Because mm. like, when it's funny because when you talked about the name of your podcast being online forever the reason that I even started modeling nude was because I I accidentally, well, my assistant, but it was, I take responsibility, accidentally leaked nudes of me on my website. It's my fault. I, I talked about it in another episode. I won't go into it, but it, it's, I gave her, I didn't give her the correct instructions. We'll oh that way. my God. So when those came out, I realized immediately, well, online forever, like uh -huh. I can't take this back. Uh -huh. there's, there's no like backpedaling on this. So I just like doubled down on it. I'm like, well, fuck it. Fuck like, it. Oh my you know, God. I'll just make money on it. Uh huh. Um, and I was with my husband, my now husband with my boyfriend at the time. And, you know, I asked like, him like how he, how he felt about it and he didn't care. He Good said boy. it was fine. And then when I decided to shoot more nudes, he was totally behind it and very supportive and actually shot a lot of my first nudes for me. Mm -hmm. But I don't think I would have probably followed that path if I hadn't been with him. You know, mm -hmm. been with somebody mm -hmm. who I felt 
like I was going to be with for the rest of my life and that supported me. I mm-hmm. think the same thing if I had been single, I would have been very concerned about what that would have made a prospective mate think of mm-hmm. me and would that have limited, you know, my ability to have like a relationship. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I I feel like there's this narrative that is in part like I don't know how true it is, but it feels true at times that like you're giving part of yourself away or something like that when you mm-hmm. do sexual things online and it is just really nice mentally to have that stable home base where you can like fill your cup back up and feel like you're not just sending it all out into the ether you know mm-hmm. like I, I love my online community of people but at the same time like they can't cuddle me at night you know so yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> 100 I mean and you also want to feel supported in whatever you're doing in your life yes. right and especially something that stigmatizes yes sex work. Mm-hmm. I mean that's you know that's that's a tough nut to crack and mm-hmm. there's a lot of like gr- guys who are who are wonderful guys who just like can't get behind that get behind that for whatever reason and that's fine mm-hmm. you know so it is difficult to find somebody who who's okay with that that like you actually want to date yes you know yes <laughs> um so I saw a tweet of yours about having your socials deleted on the same day a year prior, and Ugh. you were listing lessons you learned, including every opportunity that I thought would be my big break turned out to be a very small step, especially mm-hmm. compared with the steady gains made from cultivating consistency and authenticity. What were those big breaks that didn't up panning out like you thought they would? Mm. <sighs> well, a couple things come to mind. So one one was honestly doing pro porn. Like I've done a couple scenes with scenes with browsers and I was like, oh, I'm so honored. Like I'm with mm-hmm. browsers now. And doing a couple scenes at least, like it didn't really impact my career in a big way at all. Like I could be wrong about this, but it feels like to really take advantage of porn, you have to absolutely like grind for a while and mm-hmm. really do a lot of scenes. <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> Gotta grind it out. <laughs> <laughs> And I also have gone on some male-led podcasts, which I I don't regret. I feel like I've learned from. But, you know, I see a lot of people going on, like, have you heard of the Whatever podcast? Oh, yeah. I hate For to some even reason, say, that has come up, like, in the last couple of episodes. And it's never, really? never come up before. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Mean, it, they go viral a lot, which is so aggravating to me. But, yeah, like, doing these, like, incel podcasts, basically. Even doing, like, things like No Jumper it just had no impact on my Mm. career positively at all. Like those men are not, they're not interested in girls who look like me. I don't think if they are, they're like, can be really hateful, I find. Mm. And so looking back, it's just like, oh, I thought that this would have such a positive impact on my career and my like income. And it it just really did not I'm the things that have helped my career the most have been being consistent on TikTok and and really like working on the podcast. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so. <laughs> well, now that you've been on Holly Randall and filtered, prepare for everything to Blast just stop. blow up. <laughs> Your life's going to change. <laughs> My big break is here. <laughs> Please, everybody, go visit her profile so that is true. <laughs> Make me look good. Come on. Holly's that guy. You know? She's the gateway. I am, yes. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> I wish, man. That's why they call me Ho Rogan. Okay. <laughs> Ho Rogan unfiltered. <laughs> yes, I'm much great. I'm, I'm glad to be doing this podcast and not an incel male-led oh. podcast by someone who has nothing to do with the sex industry but is profiting from it. I just hate that shit. I profiting really from like a negative. Yeah, from it. bashing girls. I'm just like, this sucks. Yeah. What the hell? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, well, you know, everybody gets to have their say, I guess, right? You know, yes, they do. That's the... That's the, the American that we way. Live. That's the American way. You can say whatever <laughs> you want. Um, I know what you mean. I've God, I've been through the same thing where I'm like, this is the next big thing that's mm. going to make a difference. This is the next big thing. And then it isn't. No, it isn't. you have to do little things constantly. You have yeah. to go viral all the time. Like it's yeah. really it's. Yeah, that has also been a big surprise about the industry. Yeah. Yeah. So um, how have those disappointments shaped how you approach your career? I, so, hmm, trying to think, like about two years ago, I started a new OnlyFans Mm -hmm. because I, before that was just, I didn't know if I was going to do this long term or not. I was kind of one foot in, one foot out. Right. And so my focus was really on making money instead of on building like a brand that Mm -hmm. I love. And so, yeah, I made a new page like two years ago and have really just focused on 
being as authentic as possible so I don't have to lead some double life because I find that exhausting. Mm -hmm. And on like long-term sustainability and what else was I going to say? <laughs> um, How did you like, so you said you made a new page. Like what was different about this? My, I had a management company take over my old page and it mm -hmm. just completely tanked my page. Mm -hmm. And so I just created a new one where I was like, the old page is scrapped. Mm -hmm. The new one is me. It's all run by me. Mm -hmm. And I started um, working really hard on figuring out TikTok at that time as well. Mm -hmm. So that's where most of my fans had come come from. How do you know that, by the way? I'm just curious because I obviously have a TikTok mm -hmm. as well. And I, I don't know, like, I don't know if it helps me or not. It's hard to like, I don't know, like I should know this, but I don't know where my traffic comes from. I, they used to have a statistic thing on OnlyFans where you could see where your clicks were coming from every day, which it has disappeared. I don't know where it is now. Um, I know that only because... But, okay, wait, but we can't link directly to OnlyFans from TikTok. So like, how, how did they know? How do you know? I that, that one I knew because my TikTok linked to a specific Instagram. So it was coming from that Instagram. Oh, okay, that gotcha. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. But... I know that most of my fans come from TikTok because when I would go viral on TikTok, like I would have this huge surplus of fans all of a sudden. And, and then, you know, mm -hmm. a month later when their subscription or news, like those people are still who are still there. I know mm -hmm. that they came from from that. Gotcha. That makes sense. Yeah. So. So you can see like the jump. Mm -hmm. yeah. And TikTok has been the social media platform that has grown for me like the quickest over the last couple of years, too, and has built up my other socials. Um, but. Oh my God, what was your original question? How is the- How, uh, are, how are those disappointments uh, shaped how you approach your career? Yes, so yeah, just focusing more on doing, oh, I was gonna say, I don't run any advertisements anywhere either. I used to do like a lot of promo and myself, for myself and selling it. And I just nixed all of that. I'm like, I just want things to be pure. I want it to be me. And I- want it to be organic. Organic and, and sustainable. Like really accepting that you don't have to be growing as a business 100,000% of the time. Like you can have periods where you are relaxing and sustaining instead of like constantly getting bigger every month. Like it's yeah. okay. So yeah, that has been really good for my mental health and longevity. And yeah, I like running my business that way. Yeah. It's kind of like, the, yeah, this race that we get into, like constantly be growing, yes. constantly be getting bigger. And it's, it's addicting. Like, it's a, it becomes a game. Yeah. Like, over the pandemic, like I was making so much money and it just became kind of a game to me almost. It was a very surreal experience looking back and I'm glad not to be in that mindset anymore. It was pretty alienating in a lot of ways. Yeah. You know? And exhausting. Yeah. I'm sure. Definitely. Definitely. Well, Sydney, thank you so much for coming on. I do have a couple of questions for you from my Patreon members that we're going to get to in a separate segment. If okay. That's okay with you. Um, can you tell everybody online where they can find you? Yes. Uh, sydneysummers.com. It's S-I-D-N-E-Y summers.com. You can find everything there. Yeah. Fantastic. And online forever podcast. On yes. There too. Yeah. Yes. Make sure you go and visit her links and tell her I sent you so she thinks my podcast is bigger than all the rest of them. Yes. And then come watch Holly on our podcast. It's yes. Be fucking awesome. Yes. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, and you guys can find me at Holly Randall on Instagram and on Twitter. Of course, go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall unfiltered to watch these episodes streamed live. And, um, you know, if you're watching this on YouTube, please like and subscribe. Thank you guys so much for being here and I'll see you next week.